It became a mantra of modern mass media times to use the word democracy as synonymous with freedom. Some use it to describe an alternative type of regime from a self-nominated dictator, that is, with democracy being a regime where the dictators are elected, chosen by the majority of people, and say elected dictators for two reasons. The first is that mostly only the tyrants-to-be have such power ambitions, and the second is that the mass communication systems rely on the perpetuation of these tyrants to continue to exist with their way of life. And so, they will always favor the tyrants as ideology priesthoods. One good and true king dictating rule is always preferable to a rotation of tyrants every four years or so. But how does one ensure that the king is good and true? And king here is used by me in a wider, truer, and therefore mythological sense, for myth shows truth while history shows reality. Democracy is a failsafe, some could say, to ensure that if we don't like the elected dictator, we can impeach and choose another. This thought would be perfectly valid, were it not for the fact that the well from where the candidates to elected dictator are drawn from is poisoned. And it is poisoned by a collective mad and immoral belief choice that is voted upon daily. Metaphorically, if one is to be married for life, does one choose the wife from a pool of candidates? Or does one allow, by our own being, the right one to emerge in our lives. You see, in my contemplation, we have only ever lived in a democratic world. Our moral choices, our beliefs and pursuits, the way we keep our heart and mind gardens, all those are votes and have always been. The majority of those moral choices, beliefs and pursuits dictate upon the fewer what the world will be like even long before anyone had an actual vote. That majority determines the quality, or lack thereof, of the king, and his truer or falser nature. Portuguese poet Fernando Pessoa, writing under the heteronym Ricardo Reis, wrote, Reality is always more or less of what we want. Only ourselves are always in accordance with our selves. You see, it is to be realized in my contemplation that the quality of the world and our kings, plural, because we are not all exactly one, but truly differentiated, is a matter of vote. Individual, first, yes, and from there, collective. As addressed in the contemplation named moral choice, the solution to the world's puzzle is a moral one. So if one goes from there to observing the world and ourselves in it, we can clearly see that democracy as a political regime only comes when the king loses so much quality that he turns evil. So democracy first emerges as a need to limit the king's power, like constitutional monarchies, for instance, exactly because he turned evil. He fell into falsehood. With that not being enough to tackle the problem, then eventually the democratic regime is implemented to provide the ultimate, theoretical, fail-safe election. This never worked, nor will it ever work, because politics is merely a manifestation of a moral vote first cast inside our own individual souls that then becomes a majority. And the problem of power is never resolved with these checks and changes because it is being dealt with incorrectly, as it is, like modern medicine, attacking the symptom and not looking at the cause. The king, again, in the wider, truer, mythological sense, only turns evil because he is the representation of the majority's own internal moral vote. As True morality, not the many false morals that are sold, but the morality we all know to be true, of knowing what is true from what is false, and consequently what is good from what is evil, 
As true morality fades from the majority and is replaced by immorality, first secret, then gradually open as it becomes accepted, so does the quality of the king changes, for he is always the representation of the majority's vote. The moral, ethical votes cast in our daily lives, especially when nobody else is watching. So in that sense, democracy becomes, inevitably and over time, a portal for the open rule of immorality, because it does not hold accountable for review each voter's daily moral choice and integrity, but instead removes the need for such a review and individual re-evaluation as it focuses the entire responsibility on the figure of the leader. Sort of a straw man. The leader always, inevitably too, comes to represent the majority of the people's innermost moral integrity, or lack, whether or not it was elected. If the majority falls, the king falls, and so firstly, an initial counterbalance to the king's power is needed. So constitutions appear, safeguarding rights to the majority and limitations to the king's power which is not addressing the cause for the disease, which is the majority's moral fall, but continuously trying to ease up its symptoms, pretending that if you can numb pain, fever or inflammation, the cause of the disease is gone. After a while, constitutions are not enough to keep the symptoms away, and so the democratic regimes are put in place sold to be the best there is to keep symptoms away because you get to choose, supposedly from a pool of your peers, the one the majority wants as a leader, and it is so the best theoretical limitation to the individual power. Yet that pool suffers from the same disease as the majority does, which is the lack of true morality that is causing the disease in the first place. It wasn't that the king was accidentally evil. He was impersonating the majority's integrity. So it doesn't matter whether it is a dynastic king or an elected president or whatever. He will always represent the current moral undercurrent of his people. That is why, also inevitably, when democracy is implemented, it is after a while counterbalanced by the need to impose limitations not to the power of the individual, but limitations on the power of the majority this time. Why? Because if one feels one needs to vote physically for a leader, that is a symptom that we have already fallen to immoral internal soul choices, and consequently, then we can already almost certainly, albeit not entirely, conclude that whoever is voted in will represent that immorality. Immorality which is often not made conscious to ourselves, given all the social pills we have taken to subdue the symptoms we should have faced to bring it to the fore. In summary, the more one needs checks and fail-safes on morality and integrity, be them at first individual and then collective or social, the more immoral our choices have been, for otherwise we would never need those checks or fail-safes in the first place. Truth does not need. It just is immutable. And maybe some of you, especially if you have not listened to previous contemplations on this channel, may be thinking that I am preaching morality and promotion of a specific set of given values, which is understandable. I can only say that I am not. I have never set myself apart from any of my classmates, so to speak, with whom I share my notes. True morality is always a choice, a vote cast into the ballot of the world's mist. To distinguish moral from immoral, none of the living need a code of conduct. We know, if we allow ourselves to know, what is moral from what is immoral, without any education. Education, however, is useful morally only to the extent of providing us with tools that help us identify and allow that knowing to emerge within ourselves. Once the tools are given, then it is up to the individual 
to morally contemplate, discern, choose, and, consequently, vote daily. We can treat this eternal moral democracy with a metaphor about mixing colors. If each of us is a drop of paint for which we get to choose the color, whether that choice is entirely conscious or still unconscious, then we contribute to the collective world hue with that chosen color. That represents our individual moral vote. The collective hue is then determined by the mix of all colors chosen, yes, so it will not be a pure color, but it will be dominated by the prevalent tone chosen by the majority of the drops of paint. As that tone morally darkens, the more we need to fool ourselves with checks and fail-safes to numb the symptoms. Yet the moral cause, the moral solution to the world puzzle, is still always there, waiting to be found and chosen. We all, the living, one way or another, consciously or subconsciously, want a better world. Yet how many of us are willing to delve deep into their souls to be able to consciously find our missing true morality back, so that then we can vote with our being Political democracy is a collective sign that the individual moral democracy has already fallen. Will we take responsibility and look at that as symptoms for a disease to be resolved? Or will we continue to swallow the appeasing pills and wish that the symptoms simply go away? Your soul, your vote.